because that means commerce is crumbling. Turning on being like, yo, I'm going to open up a really massive store, probably not a good idea. Depends hey, on the if it's everyone stop buying off Amazon, order. the biggest goddamn store the world has ever seen. The king of stores, where stores go to be stores, their sales are down. But yes. let me take a shit ton of commercial space, and I'm going to open a brick and mortar. So a concept then, that people have been going away if from. If you can't rent a space, if you're having trouble renting something, you have to be creative, and you have to try different things. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to The Remix, the video podcast that keeps you in the mix of everything real estate. I'm Noelle Fryson and... And I'm Eric Anderson and we're really excited to have you here today. We're going to talk about how to weather the commercial crisis, the commercial storm that's coming down the pike like Hurricane Sandy. Well, first, let's introduce our legal eagle, Nima Mary. Hey! Of a Mary law firm. How who you has, doing today? Who has tons of commercial litigation experience. And tons of commercial. Um, and I watch a lot of commercials on TV. And he oh. watches a lot of commercials. Although we turned the commercials off now. Did you hear Netflix is canceling their DVD platform? It's oh my God. Because of their, com their commercial uh, rental space business is collapsing. There you go. So let's talk about it. So everybody knows so interest rates are rising. So it, commercial mortgages, right? Commercial mortgages are different than residential mortgages. Most people deal with residential mortgages. Everybody knows residential mortgages. Commercial mortgages are different. So let's just give a quick overview. Commercial mortgages usually are not fixed for more than five years. Sometimes you can get a seven year fix. Sometimes you can get a 10 year fix. There are occasions where, where you can get up to 18 or 20 years I've seen, but not typically. I'm not sure what the percentage is for it, mm -hmm. but it's there. When you have a commercial mortgage that's fixed for five years and the interest rates are rising, Nima, what happens to your rate? Um, I believe uh, there's a radio show and it says you played yourself. Noel, what it happens to your rate? Up. It goes up exponentially. Awesome. It go well. It goes up to whatever the prime. The well, it depends what your well, agreement if you says. At the very low, and now you're here, it's going to go up a lot. Right. So if typically, you it 2%. and Nima, you would know because well, commercials never get, was never two percent, right? So it's going to be okay. li LIBOR plus like prime, right? So what they'll do is they'll take like <coughs> they basically take the standard interest rate <coughs> that's published by like the Wall Street Journal. And then they'll add right points to it, like depending on so what. So typically, it is. your initial loan agreement would say, if you're today starting when you took this loan five years ago and you were at five percent, mm -hmm. right? And now we're five years later, so it's going to be whatever index you said, LIBOR, five-year Treasury, whatever, plus X number of basis points, right? Correct. So if it's the five-year Treasury was at five percent, which um, and then it was a 200 basis point increase, your rate would now jump to 7%, correct? correct. So then your 7% factor would be what you have to put into your recalculation for debt service coverage. Correct. Okay, so tell us what it, what's debt service coverage. Nina? <coughs> so guys, debt service coverage <coughs> is it's, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's how much you have to make to cover your debt, right? So service your debt. So debt service coverage. How much do I have to make to service the debt? And that's called coverage. So if your debt is $50,000 a month, you have to make $50,000 a month to cover your debt. But no bank will accept that because debts, when you just debt service coverage, that's not sufficient for the bank. Because it'll be a one-to-one, -one, right? Correct. There's no room for them mm -hmm. to have a margin of error or for you to have profits. And they won't lend on that because banks want to make smart investments. Typically, you need to be 30, 40% over your debt a good bank. two six or higher. <laughs> right, which means 26%. Yeah. But yes. for most people, it's 30, 40%. If you're established, the bank has a good relationship with you, you can get to those lower numbers, but <laughs> they'll never just walk on it. Um, so your debt service coverage does dramatically change when there's an adjustment <coughs> of your rate. Why so let's... Because I smoke like nine cigars at your house so, on your birthday. So let's, <laughs> let's dummy, let's <coughs> dummy this esophagus. down for a second. <clears throat> so you started, you got your mortgage for a certain amount, and now Truth. it's going to so raise up, four. basically. Right. So basically, you're on year five. Right, you're okay. on year five, and then and they're going to come in. And with right. commercial loans or with mm -hmm. commercial buildings, typically you have a longer term lease. So your your schedule of, le of mm -hmm. rent increases every year is already preset. Mm -hmm. And it may not be factored in for those increases that you're going to have in your interest rates when your interest rate re is resetting. So all of a sudden, right? So I have a, I'll, I'll dumb it down or I'll give you an example. I have a building that has four tenants 
and my mortgage payment, including taxes, was $4,900 a month. Well, I just reset a couple days ago, and my payment for April went from $4,900 a month to $5,900 a month. So right. I just had $1,000 taken out of my income based on that. And what if your, what if what you brought home was only that $1,000? Then I would be then, underwater. Exactly. Now, fortunately for me, this is one of my very profitable buildings where I make like $10,000 a month. So instead of so making $10,000, i am now making $9,000. But it still hurt me. It was still $1,000. I can't go out to dinner. I may have to return my Porsche because of that. So you know, but it, none it, it of that's actually happening. But what 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 to to Eric's point, that adjustment of a thousand dollars though, is that's why you don't have uh, twenty percent. Your minimum is thirty, forty percent above mm -hmm. because they need to know that when that fluctuation happens. And when it comes to commercial loans, it's not like a residential where they just look at the appraised value of your house, right? They look at your income and they look at your cash flow. So. When they look at your cash flow, they will look to see the the duration of your tenancies. They usually have to be longer than um, this period of adjustments for the loan. They'll look at that. They'll also look at your monthly rent increases, um, specifically when you have larger transactions or refinances with the same bank. Um, and then it gets even more complicated when you're owner-occupied. So if you're owner-occupied, they'll make you adjust your lease, right? So if you have multi-units and you're an owner auk and you're also getting the uh, loan on the building, you have to pay rent. The bank wants to see your lease. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you, hey, listen, you need to extend your lease four years. Your rent has to become this. This is your price per square foot you need to rent at. Like they will dictate those terms. And if your other leases don't meet it or justify it, <clears throat> you have a problem. The bank may not want to lend. You know, and this to is you. why you always have to be careful about over leveraging because in a rising interest rate market, if you are over leveraged, you could get stuck holding the bag and you may have to sell your property. You're forced to sell because if you can't get it refied, and fortunately for me, I've never been in a situation where I've gotten stuck. I've heard of it happening. Um, I understand today that banks don't want to take people's buildings, so they're going to be more apt to help them. I mean, I don't know if you've experienced any examples where people got forced into selling based on a, on a debt. Banks will take your house before your building because buildings require maintenance and buildings require management, and banks are not in the business of maintenance or management. They don't want that. So they will work with you. What you go into is a special workout group, so you'll get taken from one division of the bank to another, and then that, that division of the bank will try to get you back on your feet. They may even appoint a receiver to now run your business, but you know they're not taking over the liability and the management of it. They don't want to collect right. your rents. So they may give you a special accommodation <coughs> cheaper than whatever the normal mortgage rates would be just because they know you can't make it work. No, 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 no. They never will give you less on interest rate. Okay. They'll put it on the back end. Got it. Mm -hmm. Right where so you they'll owe. extend your payment or they'll change your loan terms <coughs> to make the payment affordable on a monthly basis. No, very seldomly will they lower So then what you are off. they doing for you? <coughs> they come in and put you in a special workout group and say basically you have a limited amount of time to figure your shit out. Mm. So you have or they'll put so it they on, give you a little bit more time to yeah, figure it out. Yeah, or, or okay. put in, they'll put a receiver in there which will go through and figure out where's your waste. Because mm -hmm. if they lent properly, you should be able to make those payments, Got right? Mm. You not being able to make those payments is usually user error, right? Even it's, if you're going from a 4% to a 7% interest rate change, I mean, that's a big That's huge. Height. But that doesn't really, to, to have that level, that level of fluctuation is 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 a lot. Happen. But yeah, I think even even at that, I mean, you know, if. I went up $1,000 and my loan on this property is, is small. It's like 400 grand. Yeah, I don't. I probably went up 3% or 4%. I, I think on, I from what, look, from what I've seen on the commercial stuff that I do, right, and Usually, like where you guys are buying a residential one family house, you don't have a lawyer for your mortgage. You just, they go through it and say, sign here at closing. Like mm -hmm. when we're doing commercial deals, I read the mortgages. Like I'll get a 150 page mortgage note in one in New York. I have to read all of it. I have to read the terms and conditions. I have to read the defaults. I have to figure out, like, you know, we did a closing on a, a massive property that had a, a very, very boilerplate paragraph on hazardous material. And I had to get them to change that because inevitably it was, there's, there's a medical component to this. Sure. And when mm -hmm. you have a medical office, you will have hazardous material. So in theory, the mere fact that they have a bin that says hazard because they have to put the needles in it would be a breach of that mortgage loan. So you always, in a commercial setting for the most part, you usually do or should have an attorney. Um, and the so banks- you would catch whether or not <clears throat> there, was, there was potential for a 5% interest rate? Yeah, I would next, read that. But that's- I would read that. You can't prevent yeah. that. You can't prevent that. 
isn't that inevitable the if the interest rates fluctuate and then you're up for a re-up? To, to a certain extent, right? You can negotiate the LIBOR plus, right? There's things like that you can do instead of being plus two. You put caps yeah. on it where it won't increase beyond though a certain percentage point, like 3% or something like that. Like we, you can negotiate these with the banks. A lot of people don't, but th these are negotiable points. Agreed. And that the base, <clears throat> I always negotiate the basis points. I always look at the basis points because it's not just about what your interest rate is. It's about what happens when your interest rate changes. And there are banks that will do 300 basis points. As you said, there are some that'll do 200. I have seen caps. I have seen floors. A floor is when the, the, the interest rate won't go any lower than what they gave it to you. Like, usually when they cap at the floor too, right? They hedge. So you can win or you can lose, but everyone stays in a fair circuit. All right, so. so Just so our, our listeners know. So you're saying if someone is getting into commercial real estate and they wanna be a commercial real estate investor, they will need a lawyer to look at their mortgage, not just the actual purchase contract. Yeah. Uh, it, I've never seen a bank not, I mean, the bank always has a lawyer. I've always had a lawyer. Yeah. So you've seen, always had a lawyer. No, the bank, the bank will require you to have a yeah. lawyer because okay. they want a legal opinion letter. So the banks, the, on commercial, guys, commercial is so different than residential, right? That's right. why we, you know, we make fun of residential on this podcast. We do um, not make fun of res We love you, residential. So <laughs> on, on, the, on the commercial level, right, it's just a lot more serious because usually it's not like, it's not a $400,000 loan. Eric mm -hmm. can vouch that that's probably something just super small. It's like an irre irrelevant almost loan for him. Um, it's the only reason you probably got it is because you have a banking relationship. Well, but it started as more, it's been paid down over the last... 10 years. Right. So banks right. want to give real loans and that's big numbers, a few million to a hundred million, 80 million, 70 million. And even a two, a, the, the, the bank on the other side wants an opinion letter, a lawyer saying, Hey, your business is valid. All these things that if you try to raise a defense in the future, they can sue the lawyer and say, Hey, we relied on your opinion to tell us that your client was in compliance. And that opinion letter comes from that opinion letter comes from the borrower's attorney. Correct. Got it. But the okay. but the lender's attorney will always ask for one. So that's kind of like a character letter saying, "I think this guy or guy <laughs> will be able to repay this loan." Is that kind of what the opinion no? It's it, it's it's more or less. It says, "Um, you're you're not claiming usury. You agree to jurisdiction. Okay. This company is validly existing in these states. Like all the material things that people usually attack okay. on technicalities." So that doesn't address whether or not the lawyer thinks this person's going to be able to keep their loan. In no, check. it has okay. to do with if they, if they raise certain defenses okay. to procedural defects right. of the document. Thus the requirement for an attorney. Got Correct. it. Got it. All right, so, so, but one thing you're, one thing you left out too is guys on larger loans, it's not, it's also not a situation where they just look at, look at your rent roll. A lot of times banks, these commercial lenders will require you to have an accompanying account in their banking institution. And they may even establish minimums that that bank account requires. So that way, if you do default on your mortgage, they know that they have an account in their bank, which they can seize, they can leverage, they can use as collateral, which they can't go in and take the money out, but they can quickly go in for an order show cause an injunction and, and lock it up, right? Yeah. They give themselves other avenues. So like a residential mortgage, you get funded, you move in, that's it. Some of these commercial loans say, hey, you need to maintain your deposit account for your business in our-, in our So every loan that I have requires that we maintain a commercial deposit there. They don't necessarily give us minimums. I've never had a minimum put on and I've never would accept a loan with a minimum on it. Um, but you have such a relationship where it's but. like they want you as a they want you as a borrower, right? Because you're a secure borrower. But yeah, commercial so, banks. That's true. Maybe I, definitely my what I get now is different than what I got when I started. And to your point earlier, everything is negotiable. And if they're if you're a new person in the commercial world, you kind of have to take more of what they offer you. Whereas the more you have and the more experience, you can negotiate more and you can show them a track record because a track record will 100% change your, your loan. Um, so if you're new, point. should you be going to the bank that you've had a personal relationship with? If you have a longstanding personal relationship at a smaller bank. At a smaller bank. In my opinion, it won't be I would the, try it ra rather JPs than going to someone you've never talked to. Um, you gotta try multiple banks, you gotta talk to people. But relationships are very important in banking. Um, and that if you have someone inside the bank that's fighting for you to get a loan there, it definitely makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when you go to committee and all the various steps, um, you know, guys and they do commercial loans, like legit, they sit there with a pile of loans and a committee reviews every single one of yep. them. And at, at a certain level, they aren't lending on the project. They're lending to you mm. as the operator and they will look at you and they will scrutinize you. And if, mm. even if you're 
bankable and everything else is good and you have character issues that are out in the press, then they're out. So we've had, I've had clients who go to a bank and their financials are, they're overqualified for the loan, but because of some story that was out or a lawsuit that they were involved in, right? They don't want to get, get you, like a, a fraud lawsuit, they, they'll, they'll walk. So let's, yeah, so good point. So like even during COVID, when a lot of banks offered deferments for commercial properties for a couple months to help ease the burden of, of maybe tenants not paying, we never took any of those deferments. We just kept paying. So that alone, all of my banking relationships remember that we always paid throughout COVID. Mm-hmm. So that even solidified the strength for us as a client. But um, so all this stuff is super important. But I want to I want to talk about how do we help people avoid these crises? So well, wait, we, we before we get to how to help them avoid the crisis, there's something else on top of the interest rates. What is it? It's the fact that office space is on a decline. People no True. longer want office space. So all over Silicon Valley, they're doing layoffs. People are now working from home. So mm-hmm. the need for office space has gone down immensely. Which means no tenant. Which means no tenant. Which means crisis. If, if you have no tenant, then you can't get rent. And if you can't get rent, then you can't pay the bills. Right. So with that, on t- with that being on top of it now, how do you creatively not fall into this rut? What can you do? It's scary. You can't do anything. No, don't say that. You can. No. Listen, if you have a commercial building and there's no demand for office space, you can continue to drop the price and rent your space on the cheap, which just devalues the rest of your building, right? But even then, if, you, if there's no demand and you have supply, you can't create demand, right? That's the reality. And that's why commercial real estate is uh, a big boy game. Right, could big girl, yes. big boy. Right, at the end of the day, you take the highs and you take the lows. If you have an anchor tenant that's a grocery store in a shopping mall, that grocery store closes. Right, it's not easy. You don't just refill that kind of space. You're going to be empty for years, and you got to carry that building for that time. So, so I think it, yes, so we've talked about ways that yeah, you could but be I, I think it depends on the size. So if you're an average or a beginner commercial uh, landlord or investor, it's much easier than if you were a um, corporate you know owning these big strip malls um as as nima said so it's super hard to fill a two hundred thousand square foot supermarket it just doesn't happen overnight but if you have a smaller office building you know where you have spaces that are like a six thousand square foot space you could come up with alternatives that could be done there to try to rent it so first your first issue is you have to go to your zoning office in your local municipality and understand what you are allowed to do and what you aren't allowed to do. So um, one example is you could take a, an office product and divide it up into smaller units and create small office rentals, okay? So rather than now looking for this big monster conglomerate office tenant, now you can go out and you can get 50 office tenants to take that same space. And yes, you may be renting it for a little bit lower for each unit, but it potentially when you get all those half spaces rented, you may actually equate to what you had before or may make more money. Um, it's a ton more work and it requires a lot of dedication to get that going. But, that's but if you want to keep your building, then you got to put in the work. It's a, a way to, to be creative to do that. Um, another way that you could go and do some of this stuff is take matters into your own hands. So let's say you have a broker that's working for you. Not all brokers are created equal. It's very hard to get off, we're talking office specific. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to get office tenants right now. Um, there are other ways to go out and get tenants. You want to go and, and connect yourself with the local chamber of commerce. You want to put ads on social media. Talk about what's yep. special about your building. Um, maybe if you have a space that's a typical office look with a drop ceiling and you know ugly carpets, you could take that, you can change it and turn it into more of a loft atmosphere and give something different in that market that no one else has. You have to look and see where the creative needs are and try to create something that fits into that area. It's it's totally doable. One section that I was reading that they're saying is not going to experience this crisis is multifamily, right? So because the interest rates are up, people don't want to necessarily buy houses with the interest rates being high, or they can't buy houses with the interest rates being high, so then they turn to rents. Now, how feasible is it to take your commercial space and turn it into apartments. Is that even really feasible? 
So, so then you it, get the it could residential be feasible. rents. If you just have a shit ton of money, it could be feasible. Your entire building. Okay, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. If you have that's a lot asking, of, if you have so back to what Nima just said, you have to have the capital to do that. And if you have a ton of capital to make a massive conversion like that, you probably have enough capital to, to weather a, a storm for a year and leave your space empty. Okay. So it really depends on the situation. Like what's happening in Manhattan. There's so much empty office space that people are taking these monster buildings and turning them into residential product because, uh -huh. uh, and I'm not a big Manhattan expert, but I understand there's such a high demand for, for residential there that it, it's making sense in some of those projects. But um, I've converted a small office building into residential and it worked out great for me. Was it hard to do? Was it like- It was a big project. Yeah. It cost, you know, probably- Well, just put, put it into context, right? The building so, costs 400. Your, your, your ha entire square footage here is what? First floor. What's in the first floor? The building we're in now, yeah. it's like four thousand feet. Okay, how many bathrooms do you have? We have two on this floor. We have two on this floor. Okay, so and if two you, upstairs. If you had six hundred unit apartments and wanted to make these all apartments, forget the common area mm. issue, right? So, so you have six thousand on this floor. Mm. So six hundred. So you say six hundred because you got to factor another way of eighty for a hundred for common space. You put you could put in theory with these numbers like seven apartments you need seven bathrooms mm -hmm. seven kitchens seven separate uh utilities designed to service each of them i mean it, how do so you, the plumbing and septic wouldn't hold it is that what you're saying well, forget the septic because this is sewer no, right it's, so, okay. it's a lot of money no it it, it it would just you would have to literally reconfigure your entire yeah. building how would the how would the pipes that service your two bathrooms and the sewage lines how would they begin to now have to add six more like where would you connect them to it it would it, be a gut rehab. I was just asking. Yeah. Yeah. No, just no, asking. it's a good yeah. question for a lot of people who, who don't know, right? A lot of people, like we've, I've looked at some commercial properties and said, okay, well up here, they were like little offices. I was like, I can do six, seven apartments. And then I just thought of the logistics and the conversion. I'm just, I'm like, oh, fuck it. So I think part of the, the comment you made was multifamily is not going to get hurt as much. So nope. multifamily, because of the interest rates rising and the lack of homes turning over, more people are renting. More people renting means a stronger rental base for those multifamilies. So as their interest rates go up, in theory, their rents are going up, which is going to help offset some of the interest rates. Yeah, rate but I, I, I disagree with that, right? It, it, the way it works, statistically speaking, is as interest rates go up, rents go up, right? But what we've seen here is this weird blender where rents just went up because they went up because of sure. COVID. Mm -hmm. well, so they yeah. were not really reflective of interest rates. And now rents are so high that even as interest rates are going up, people are clawing back rents because they're, they're unjustifiable. So now you have this weird scenario where rents are actually going down while rates are going up. And that's creating a almost a perfect storm because once rents start going down, it becomes a game of how low can we go because everyone landlord is now out, has to outbid the other landlords. Well, have you really seen <clears throat> rents going down? Because everything yes. out there says it's going up. No, it's going down to offer a cheaper product, right? <laughs> in the re in the residential rental Absolutely. market, <coughs> Absolutely. I think it depends on the market you're in. Okay, Let's because now market, the Ridgewood, a four thousand no, dollar house. Franklin Lakes. Okay, so Same you difference. looked in Ridgewood. Is it? No, you, we did look in Ridgewood. Bergen County, a four thousand dollar house is now thirty seven fifty, right? Rents are down. They're going down. I haven't seen that. The median rent right now, and someone was just telling this to me the other day, in New York City is forty five hundred dollars. But again, it, it's incomparable, right? And we, that's like the median against studios to three bedrooms. But again, it, it like, still statistics are just so nonsensical. Like whoever, like whoever told you that, just go back and be like. Please don't give me useless statistics. I'll tell you why, right? Because people like to spew this shit mm -hmm. and they think that they know what they're talking about because they can give you hot little items that they see on Instagram pop up in their feed. Look, how can you possibly take where they charge $200,000 a month for a, a building midtown and compare it to a shithole on Chinatown that gets you know rent subsidized at 1200 a month, but it's worth five. Like that number is so arbitrary. But what you have to look at is what's going on in New York, what's going on with the demand, and is real estate being withheld to create a supply and demand issue hmm. for mortgage principles? And the answer to that, in my opinion, is yes. A lot of loans in New York on these big new constructions tether defaults to occupancy. But then they negotiate occupancy rates based off percentage factors that occupancy is is calculated based off of how many units are for rent, like on the market that you have listed versus how many units you have. So they take these buildings and they don't list the entire building. They do it in sequences because they'll only list 
20 apartments and when they fill up those 20 or get close to it, they release and offer new apartments. Mm -hmm. So they always stay within their vacancy rate so they don't default their mortgage. So it's such a manipulated game in New York that none of these metrics are remotely valid or make sense, in my opinion. I'm not... I always thought that was part of the strategy of not flooding the market with too many units because then you can keep the prices higher. Yep, and people like they're they're building like crazy in New York because everyone likes New York. But you know that's the that's the reality. When you look at it, <coughs> rents are going are going down. Maybe in certain areas like Hackensack yeah. that are hot and new, they haven't yet. But mm. honestly, I think they are, they have and they will. But mm -hmm. the reality is, the people can't afford it. People are now putting groceries on. This is a real fact. They they, they come out. The, the credit census comes out with these. These are real statistics of like pay, 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 the amount of debt on people's credit cards. What are they? And now people are in debt over grocery bills. Mm. People go into debt over superfluous spending. When you go into debt over necessities, mm. that's the beginning of your dominoes falling apart. Because you've maxed out your debt, you can't cut what you're spending on. You're not buying an extra sweater or two or going shopping and you're irresponsible. Right. You need you're food. buying milk and groceries. Sure. So back to being creative. High pay rent. To wait, prevent wait, this wait, from before, happening. before we get back to being creative, guys, if you love this religion that these men are spouting, right? This gospel. Please smash that button. Subscribe, 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 right? Right. Yes. All Subscribe. I ask is, guys, if you're going to smash a button, just don't hit it and quit it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Comment Subscribe. too. Subscribe. We're on go. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. If you want to hear this kind of talk every single week, subscribe to the remix. We need to know if your rent is rising. Yes. Okay. Very important. So okay. Back to crisis. Creative. So I have a great example for a warehouse crisis, right? Even though we know that the warehouse crisis you know, over this whole COVID thing and with all the home deliveries being huge, warehouse space has just been through the roof. I, I see that FedEx and um, Amazon sales are slowing. People seem to be buying less. So now warehouse space is becoming a little more relaxed in certain areas. So a great area or a great idea for that is something we had talked mm. about, taking a warehouse and turning it into classic car storage. That's a creative way. No, we're not going to talk mm. about that on this podcast. Okay, but it's a creative way of taking space and reconfigure. I disagree. It. I think it's a horrible idea. I don't think any of you should even consider doing it on this podcast. And I think I'm not going to tell her shit anymore about my creative ideas. Until <laughs> I have scooped up everything on the inventory. There you go. But well, what about turning things into parking lots? You should always do that. And then we don't make money. Sell it to me. So I can put up a creative solution. Or you take a warehouse and you turn it in. We have one client right now that's turning a, a warehouse into a um, dormitory. Paddle ball. What is that new pickleball thingy? That's, uh, that's an amazing yeah, idea to go grow. Yeah. Well, Why? They're, they're spending Pickleball's a ton of money now. and they're taking a warehouse Everyone traditionally used Pickleball. for warehousing. It's so and stupid. Pickleball. It's so dumb. Guys, it, because you like a sport or hobby, please don't think that just because you like it, <laughs> other people like it too. It's cool. It's hot right now. Great. But we, what your cost per square foot to construct something that may be a fad, may not be a fad, <clears throat> and alter, alternately, alternatively, you know, doesn't give you a return per square foot, right? That's quantifiable then it's not, it's not a good investment. You're building a novelty project. You're a business owner. Go take an SBA loan and pray you have enough people who want to play pickleball, paddleball, and don't have a membership to a country club because they usually is a course there anyway too. Court. Anyway, it's working for this. <laughs> it's working for this. Way Has he built it yet? It's in process. All right. I want one year on this podcast, tell us if they're selling sneakers out the back of that place to cover the rent. Another great option. Take a warehouse and turn it into retail. <laughs> Make it into the biggest sneaker wholesaler out there. Unless the economy is crumbling, because that's usually when the <laughs> commercial economy... Oh my God, economy the doom and gloom. It's not doom and gloom. When sides. your economy crumbles, because that means commerce is crumbling, turning on being like, yo, I'm going to open up a really massive store, probably not a good idea. It depends hey, on the if it's everyone stop store, buying off Amazon, work. the biggest goddamn mm -hmm. store the world has ever seen. The king of stores, where stores go to be stores, their sales are down. But yes. let me take a shit ton of commercial space, and I'm going to open a brick and mortar. So a concept then, that people have been going away if you from. can't rent a space, if you're having trouble renting something, you have to be creative and you have to try different things. So then what would you tell people to do? How are you? How can we Crawl help Crawl under your bed and wait for me to tell you it's time to come out. I've heard the, I've heard the well, phrase. We all know that's not the answer. Uh, just survive till 25. No, that's what they've been find saying. A, find, just survive till 25. Wow. Find Who a way. That one? Find a way. Know. Yahoo Finance. <laughs> find a way to make money with low overhead, right? And and opening a business with brick and mortar requires overhead, utilities, staffing, build out, construction. 
Don't go into a burning building. Buy the building after it burnt down and then rebuild it. Like, uh, I agree with that. You're, you're, you're like, you could buy it as it's burning. Yeah, guys. The, cre- <laughs> the, the, no the creative <laughs> insurance company may come and investigate you, but the creative ideas Eric is talking about are like one-offs and like they're cool if you just have extra money around and you want to find a way to see will this work, will it not work. Like this is not for novices. This is not for beginners. And realistically speaking, just weather yourself and be ready for there to be. A, a problem. If you are a current holder of commercial space, well, understand that your rents are going to be low and you made a ton of money in the past. I hope you saved it and didn't buy a bunch of cars. And realistically, put in the warehouse. <laughs> live off of that <laughs> and wait for the right tenant to come in. But vet your tenant because nobody wants a tenant yeah. whose business will fail because now, <clears throat> not only not getting rent, someone has rebuilt out your space that you're going to have to gut. And they're not paying you. It's going to take you time and money to kick them out. And you have to start covering the taxes. Like, it's a disaster. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that. If you have a space that's empty, okay, and you can get a tenant that you think can last for six months to a year, as long as they're not doing some massive build out, like you just said, and they're not damaging your property, it may not be a bad thing to get them in to cover that short window of time. Depends. Especially in New Jersey, you're 25, we're thriving, surviving (laughs) till 25. We only have to get through the next year and a half. I, look, in Jersey, it's easier to kick people out, right? Hmm. But New York takes forever. There's just a lot of different factors. Right. It depends on your and, market. And, uh, honestly, and I'll be the first to say this, like there's this guy, Judge Powers. We had a tenancy action in front of him and he just unilaterally decided, I'm going to give this tenant 15 days. In my opinion, completely violates the statute and everything it stands for, but he's just in a mood. So you don't also know what you're going to get. Right? You just don't. <laughs> FYI, that was residential, not commercial. Fine, but you just don't know what you're going to get. So okay. you look at the law and you say, this is what it is. But if you get a guy like, in my opinion, Judge Power is going to come out there and just do what he wants. <laughs> so, hi, what Judge good does Powers, that do? Just are the opinions <laughs> expressed by. Anyway, I, I don't think that or it, it is important to know your market, it is important to know your, your judicial system and the flavor. Every municipality, in my experience, Judges have different flavors. I think that the some judges, can be more pro tenant, some can be more pro landlord. Give more towards residential, aren't they more lax with different residential? Laws, really. Different laws, it's different right? laws, okay. different yes. laws. Like there was, there was, a, there was a, the, the existing judge who did tenancy. Everyone knew what they were going to get with them. You paid, you stayed. You didn't, you were out. Mm-hmm. If you had a hardship argument, he would make it. It was by the book, mm-hmm. right? But my point in saying this is not to say be negative, but it's to say you don't know what's going to happen. Where right. you may think I'll have somebody out in X amount of time. You may that. not. So the cor- do your research. Talk to other commercial uh, landlords in the area. Find out what their uh, their experience with evictions is. If they in say the it's area. good, I said in the area. Yeah. If they say that it's good and you can get people out relatively quickly, take the chance. It, Some money is better than no money. It varies per county. It varies per state. Yes. Right? Yes. Like New York, it's not even like, okay, you've gone to court quick and you have an extension. You're looking six months to a year for to get someone out. commercial in New wow. York? Because I don't commercial? know commercial. And wow. residential. It's residential, br- I know, is a disaster. It's brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. So when you, you have to... Fa- I've got a tenant who's losing almost $100,000 a month. Wow. It's six months, seven months, we're yeah. not in court yet. You're screwed. Right? It's a lot. It's intense. So all of these people who have the doom and gloom and they're going to lose their buildings, if you have money... Right, you have money in your pocket. You have not gotten into commercial real estate. Is this the time to start investing with all of these people that are going to default? I think so. Well, As inve- the prices, uh, all right. Let's talk about the grammar of that. Investing with them, no, or investing, comma. Meaning, is this the time to start investing in commercial real estate it's, if you have the money to do so? Because all of these other people email. are going to default. So is it best? So you're not to, you're not like going in with someone who has something you're going to buy. No, you're going to okay. take it from them. You're going to say, "I'm sorry that you couldn't cut it. Now it, I'm going to take it and it, make money." It's, it's honestly, truly speaking, for probably I this is like for majority of the people who are listening to this podcast. You won't get the opportunity until it's gone through so many hands mm-hmm. of people who've passed up on it that then is really not a good deal. Because when it comes out, when it comes in these workout groups, these major brokers, like there's an inner circle, they have friends, people well, know who to talk to, and a lot of people get first dibs. And not even the brokers. <clears throat> when I know from my past banking experience, there's, as we talked about earlier, there's a board, there's an investment board or a loan committee at these banks, when they have a project that's not working or it's about to go into foreclosure, those 12 people that sit on that board all chew on the building and say, is it something that we should buy to get Mm -hmm. it off our books and to get it performing? So Nima's right, 
the average person is going to find that deal and it's already going to be garbage. Um, so that's very important. Always know where your deals are coming from. But I do think there's going to be opportunities. And I, but I think there's always opportunities. I've been you're preaching, very, you know, you're I've been optimistic. preaching this. No, we're, we're going into an opportunity of a lifetime area where there's an opportunity of a lifetime when it was high. There's an opportunity of a lifetime when it's low. Correct. Right. But don't look at like massive commercial deals. Don't expect volume. Hopefully you'll find one that's worth it. And you can build off that one. You're going to see a lot more in residential, possibly multifamily. A lot of people bought a house, two, three family. They overpaid by 20, 30%. I've seen more. They're renting out the others, living for free, mm -hmm. and they may lose a tenant. One of those tenants may not be able to pay, and they were counting on that to pay their mortgage. And that's where you're going to start seeing issues. you got to be creative. Sometimes if you have a space, you can't fill it with one tenant. You fill it with three tenants. One of, one of my friends uh, uh, has a multi-tenanted space. So you cannot do that, guys. If it's residential and you, you can. No, not unless you have a license to be a room and board house. I, that's that's there's a caveat to that you can do something which is called co-living and as long as there's no locks on those individual doors and the people are friends they can live together those are roommates yes correct and then you have okay. one, but you have one lease you can't <laughs> have three leases roommates. so but yes yeah, so that's so not co-living you you you're just leasing no, to three you, you, roommates right. you have, yeah. each person gets added to the lease but if you're the landlord and you're creating that environment you can mm -hmm. do it there's sure. ways to be That's creative. not illegal because so you, you be have one lease with three there... people in it and everyone's responsible. But it's still three people that you... didn't know each other at one point. And that's a way to get around. Yeah, that's you help network you can't rent that space, there's ways. There's always ways to be creative. You just have to think outside the box. In the listing, can you put great for roommates or something like that? I think it's more of where you actually have to go out there and talk to people and, and, and make things happen. Match go to, make. If we're doing residential, you you know, and you're by a college campus, you go and you make these connections and you try to make things work. Guys, just make sure you talk to a lawyer when you do that lease because there's not legal advice, but you know, you, you, like everyone has to be 100% responsible for the total amount yeah. of rent. Like you can't, like it has, they have to do it in a certain way that you are compliant with the law. Um, that's, you don't always have to be compliant with the law. If you have an illegal rooming yeah. board house, like the consequences are so extreme. It's just almost not. Can't you do that for commercial then? Can't you go out and find three? Yes. You were just well, Eric said up. that earlier, right? Yeah. So right. Like, Eric and I have a building. Like a WeWork. And, you know, had an issue. Tenants not paying us rent. So at one point, we're going to have to do something about that. And instead of renting out this massive space in one, we discussed just putting up walls. And where there was one big floor, mm -hmm. we're going to put in like 10 small offices. And the mom and pop businesses who just need an office, those kind of survive even do, during COVID because yes. they have low overhead. So we'll rent Got out it. one room, two room, three room, and we don't have the whole space empty. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're making a quarter of it in the beginning, but once we filled it up, now we're good. The only problem is, right, and where it's different is, now we've re repurposed that area. It's difficult to then go back and get one nice tenant for the whole big area. So you have to understand everything, every action has a reaction. So you can't just do that and then say, okay, well, I can go back. Now I got to knock down walls. It's, it's more construction, more work. So we're, we're then saying, okay, this is our new business model going forward until we tear everything down and put up apartments, right? So yes. you have to like, you can't just look at it as a, a temporary thing. If you're going to do it and you just want to do it for a year or two, it doesn't make sense because you're going to build it out. Then you got to take it apart, get those people out. It's very difficult to reconvert back to your prior usage. So you have to really sit, analyze the market, look at it from a long-term perspective and make the decision that this is going to be an otherwise permanent change. <clears throat> in most cases, I agree with that. If if you're getting tons of rent and it makes sense to invest that money for two years, then sometimes it could be worth it. Yeah, if you have it. Yeah, sure, there's a always an exception. Area, yeah. If someone walks in and says, hey, knock right. these walls, I don't want this whole space yeah. and I'll pay you uh -huh. X amount of dollars. You're like, yeah, sure, yeah. Where's, the, where's the hammer? But if you know you're, you're killing the place in a year, then it's probably not worth it. Um, but one other thing that's important is don't be afraid to take lower rent. You know, um, mm -hmm. someone that, that I learned uh, from who owns a ton of properties over the years when I started, he said to me, a rented space is better than a non-rented space. And Dude, just that guy sounds a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Yo, can I have his number? This is like Sun no, Tzu of real estate. No, actually, actually he, Lao gave, Tzu. Yeah, he gave me his, the book. Niccolo Sun Machiavelli. He um, gave me the Sun Tzu book. And he gave me the non, he gave me the original version. And I tried reading that. And but I was who like, gave you the one? Hold the on. One, so during COVID, yeah. when I had COVID for the first time. Did he call you with Noel a bunch of wisdom? Gave, a gave long me, call gave me the, is worse than a short call. Noel gave me the translation <laughs> from the initial. Um, the Art of War. Yeah. The initial Art of War right. to the, to the English version man. of yeah. Art of War. And it, it was such a great experience down. for me because I actually could 
enjoy reading the book that was translated versus the one that wasn't translated. So it's someone gave you the I Chinese did. version of the book? Oh, no. Someone, it not wasn't the Chinese. Chinese. It was just like, so, the, the, it was like the Shakespearean version where it was hard, you know, when you're learning in high school. Me fail English? That's impossible. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's go back to the theme of today's podcast, the Which wisdom is, we want to leave you, right? Rented space is better than unrented space. <laughs> That's right. Rent that space. I hope you tell your children up. this advice. No, you can but always that do, makes sense. You can that, always do a short term rental. Right. Well, <laughs> shit, no, that does no, make a because, lot of sense. Wait, wait. Fuck, people, here I was intentional have a tendency on renting be, my apartment. People have a tendency <clears throat> to be like, if I can't get what I want for something, then I don't want to yes. work with that other uh -huh. person. But if you're going to get a little bit less and it's going to stop you from defaulting on your loan, take that little bit less. There's so there's I agree, but there's so many factors into it. Like, look, well, the moment you take less, it's hard to go back up because your MLS listing now shows that you're renting it for a loss, mm. right? So unless you have a justifiable reason to go back up, you do have an issue that don't put it in the MLS. Don't put it in the MLS. Okay, that's one thing. Then on top of that, you have then you have less market to people, right? And you're already having a tough time renting it. Then another another scenario is you have okay, so you drop the rent a little bit, you've locked it up, that's okay. And I actually agree with that because if you look at it, if someone think let's use numbers, four thousand yes. dollars a month rent. It's $48,000 a year, and someone wants to pay you $3,800 a month. You don't take that. $200 is $2,400 a year. That's how much you lose a year. If you're empty for one more month, you just lost $4,000. Yep. So mm -hmm. that one extra month that you don't rent that place, you've now lost $1,600 more than renting it for $200 less. That's why you right? rent it. And then you do a one-year lease, and then you tell them, look, this is a discount. Yep. We're going up. <coughs> you send them notice to quit, and the demand for rent increase to what you think the market should be if the market's changed. And if not, you keep them, and you figure out, right, I'm losing 24 And you put that all in. Month. You can put a holdover clause in your lease where they can pay 100% of their rent on top of it. There's so many ways to tweak leases where you're not going to get in trouble with that scenario. But always keep the space rented at all costs, especially during a trying time like this. So are people going to come through this? Hell yeah. I mean, yeah. no one's gonna don't, <laughs> people, like, look. Yeah. No one's no one's gonna die. No one's jumping off bridges. Uh, but but you the lose everything. But the reality is, are people gonna come through this? A lot of people are not gonna financially come through this. No, and good. Like honestly, that's life. That's cycle. People need to live. People need to die. Did he just say good. <laughs> He did. <laughs> people need to succeed. People need to fail. We don't live in a utopia, right? And if people don't fail, people can't succeed. There has to be a difference between those who get things done and make money and those who lose money. And there needs to be people who lose money for people to make money. So it's so just the way on to circle. To, to follow through on that, if you feel like you can't handle the situation and things are getting out of control for you and you have the opportunity to sell, mm -hmm. maybe not for the number that you wanted or the number that you could have gotten before the interest rate shows. It's okay to sell. It's okay to get yourself out of a negative situation, regroup, and then as interest rates come come back down and more opportunities present themselves, you can get back into the market. Don't let yourself get into a hot water issue. Don't let yourself get foreclosed on. Work through, either figure out how to rent it or get rid of it and 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 save your don't, your. Don't double down your mistakes. My yeah. father used to always tell me sometimes cutting a loss is a win. So if you're losing and you know you're losing, cut your loss. Yep. Take the loss and move on. Because if you keep trying to save it, you're going to just drown yourself. Like, you know, sometimes you, th you see in these movies, someone's trying to save someone from drowning. And, and they, they end up drowning uh, themselves because uh -huh. that person takes them down with them. Yep. Sometimes you just got to let, let something drown. Yeah. Because it's too dangerous for you to try to save it. And you're respected for that. People respect decision making. So you see someone People, drowning up, banks, just walk by. A bank will respect that you took a loss. A bank's not going to respect that they went into foreclosure and had to take the building from you. No, you sit down and be like, the numbers don't make sense. Yeah. You know, let's let's figure out a way to, for me to get mm -hmm. out of this building. And they'll work with you. Right? Yeah. But if you just don't pay them for like three years and then it goes to auction and they you're have to done. buy it back out of their own auction, yep. you're just like, you know, just pissed, pissed off. Yep. I love that. So I love, the, that I love that, that don't double down on mistakes and always keep it rented. That's that's what we're going with. Because why? A rented apartment <laughs> is better than an unrented apartment. Eric we're Anderson. We're going with that. Shut we're up. We're good. Anyway, we hope that um, some of these tips have helped you. They We'd are. like to hear your stories. Put put in, in the comments below. Let us know the trouble that you're having, and we'll see if we can help you out and give you some advice. And remember, guys, at the end of the day, a rented apartment <laughs> is better than a non-rented apartment. I was apartment. gonna say, first, Gump found a way to get rich. If you can, <laughs> that's on you. Oh my god. Oh well, hey remember if you visualize it, you can own it. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye.